All right, we are recording. I'll go through and mute everyone. Thank you, Tony. So uh, this is Adam Fry. I'm the director of programming for the uh, APTI Chapter Development Council. And uh, I want to welcome you uh, to this meeting and uh, encourage you, if you have a question or an issue, um, to use the chat window to um, type it in. Uh, and I'll be watching that. And uh, today we have as a presenter uh, Stephanie Rogers. Uh, and I just want to say a little bit about her for those who maybe don't know her. Uh, she is a former board member of APTI and the president-elect of the Research Triangle North Carolina chapter of APTI. She's got a special research interest in uh, particularly the artisan temperament. So that's quite relevant to our subject of the missing uh, sensation function in uh, APTI. Uh, she has served as MBTI qualifying faculty. She's worked with Linda Behrens uh, Temperament Research Institute, now called the Behrens Institute. She's been studying type for over 20 years. She uh, has a degree as a sociologist from the University of Southern California, and her preferences are ENFJ. So she's, I've asked her to present to us a bit about uh, the subject of the missing sensation function, and then we'll be able to uh, have some conversation and questions about it. Stephanie, go ahead. Okay. Welcome, everyone, and thanks for inviting me. Um, I think your topic is important and relevant and one that's been around for a long time. Um, just as a bit of an overview, um, we need to address the, um, the fact that half of the 16 types are grossly underrepresented in APT. Um, that's all of the sensing types. And when you really think about how many members we have and how underrepresented um, sensing types are within our chapters and um, the organization as a whole, it's, um, it, it really does not bode well for us and what our mission is to really um, make type available to everyone if we can't even bring members in to represent all of the types. So that's the primary focus today. Um, within that context, there's a couple of things I want to talk about, about the underrepresentation having to do with motivation and what motivates um, sensing types to attend and become members. And also what are some of the deterrents um, that we have? What are the turnoffs for sensing types? Um, and then the implications for APT in general. What does it mean to be without sensing types as an organization? And how can we attract sensing types to our chapter meetings and keep them, which is equally as important. And then I'll finish off with some special notes about artisans in particular. Um, as Adam mentioned, that is my particular focus area. And then I'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, I also have, um, most of you should have received, there's a bit of a handout to go along with it. I put some things down. I do want to qualify that, however. My tone can sound a bit over the top. Um, just know that it has to do with brevity. Um, I am an ENFJ. I have dominant extroverted feeling and it can come off as scolding and preachy when I'm in a rush and even for this um, event. Um, half an hour is not a lot of time and I have a lot of material I want to cover so I might not sound as warm and fuzzy as I would like to sound. So please excuse the tone and look for the nougats of, of relevant information. Um, and, and please use the handout um, with your chapters, share the information, feel free to do that. Um, but do know that in my heart I am an advocate um, and have been an advocate for all types but in particular artisans for the last 20 years and when I have an opportunity to be on my soapbox and say things that um, they have asked me to communicate, um, I can get pretty um, 
on my soapbox about it. So please, um, my, apologize, uh, my apologies up front for that. Um, the way our uh, sensing types have been underrepresented is not a new issue. Um, Adam mentioned that I was on the board of directors for Apton International. That was 20 years ago in 1993 and 94. At that time, I was elected as a member at large, and we had a focus on membership, and I was that person. So this issue was an issue that we were dealing with 20 years ago. Why aren't sensing types coming to our chapter meetings? Why aren't they joining APT Inter International? Um, where are they? Why won't they be interested? And I have to say, I think we have really um, grown over the last 20 years in, in our thinking about that. Um, 20 years ago, there was kind of a general current of opinion, oh, they're just not interested in this. And I think we can pretty much dispel that notion. They are interested, but the way we organize ourselves as an organization and chapter meetings may not meet their needs specifically and may not hold their interest and attention um, in a way that we would like to hold it. Um, this is not just about APT. I think it has to do with any membership organization. I want to be that clear about that. And particularly in these times, um, membership organizations of all kinds, their membership is down. It's not the way people are accessing information these days. Um, there's lots of other things that are vying for their attention. So um, in particular, I think sec sensing types find other resources to meet those needs rather than a membership organization. So if we want to attract them to a membership organization, there's extra things we have to be doing that is not our typical inclination as a predominantly um, intuitive organization. Um, I'll speak more to those specific issues, but I did just want to comment that this has been a problem for a long time. It's not that we used to have a fair representation of all types and then it disappeared. This has always been a problem since the beginning of APT. Um, motivation, and that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about what would motivate any type, and for the purposes of this meeting, we're talking about sensing types. What would motivate them to join a membership organization, to participate at the chapter level and at the national level? And when we're talking about motivation, I really think that um, temperament best lends itself to that discussion. Um, it's, it's e motivation is easily identified through temperament. Um, just in case everyone is not totally on board with terms, um, I still use David Kiersey's terms, guardians for SJs and artisans for SPs. So guardians would be the um, types that have dominant introverted sensing or auxiliary intro introverted sensing. So that would be ESTJ, ESFJ, ISTJ, and ISFJ. And the SPs are the artisans, and they have extroverted sensing as their dominant function, ESTPs and ESFPs, or as their auxiliary function, the ISTPs and the ISFPs. So if we look at it from a motivation standpoint, the guardians are really motivated to participate in membership organizations whenever it serves their family or their profession, their community, um, and also role is very important. So if it enriches whatever role they have in one of those areas, that will make the difference. But they have lots of different organizations vying for their attention in all of those different roles. They have um, religious communities, fraternal communities, um, community organizations, all of those different roles in addition to whatever professional roles they might have um, to 
to spread their time over. And so they are very specific about making sure that whatever way in which they spend their time and their money, it is serving the greatest need, whether it's their personal need or whether it's on behalf of some other group that they're affiliated with. But if the organization doesn't, every time they show up, demonstrate benefit to that, they're not going to keep coming. Um, I also think it's important to remember that if they don't keep coming, it doesn't mean that they've been turned off by type. They haven't necessarily lost interest in type. It just means that other priorities have come to the surface and they need to address those priorities. For instance, there's usually a huge change in the membership affiliations of Guardian once they have children. It's true of everyone, but the way in which they commit to those different organizations changes in very specific ways for Guardians. And so what may still be of an interest is no longer a priority on their list of membership affiliations. Artisans or the SPs are motivated to participate in membership organizations when it provides opportunities to meet their own agenda. Um, can't underemphasize agenda enough when we're talking about artisans. Um, and it's their agenda of the moment. It's the thing that is the top interest for them at the moment. Um, they want the opportunity to engage with other people who are sharing that interest. So they want to be able to see it, they want to be able to talk to people about it, they want to engage in it fully so that they can explore what it's about. Um, they want to get into it and usually they are looking for answers to things and that's why it's on their agenda. Um, and again, like with the guardians, if they don't show up, it doesn't mean that they're not interested in type or that they won't come back eventually. It just means that other things have risen to the top of their agenda for the moment and they've moved on to that. So um, I think there's, there's something important in that motivation piece to understand that they're not, neither one of these groups are groups that are just going to hang out in a membership organization um, just for the benefit of the camaraderie they are going to want something out of it. Um, they expect results out of it. And if they don't see that on a meeting to meeting basis, um, it, it just moves further down on their priority list. There's some specific turnoffs that I've noticed for guardians and artisans for all sensing types. Over the years, people have talked to me about it, mentioned things, um, some of the specific ones are there's too much discussion and not enough demonstration and skill building. And they really want specific um, things that they can see and apply in their own world. We all want this, but they specifically feel let down if they don't get it when they leave. Um, whereas a lot of times the intuitives can be just as just as satisfied to have had a great discussion, even if there wasn't anything that they necessarily could take home and apply. Um, another big problem, I think, for anyone coming into a sensing, if, with a sensing preference, into a new chapter or into wow, a new setting great. for a chapter, is that um, they. Um, We are so thrilled as intuitives whenever someone of sensing preference walks in the room, our over-enthusiasm at their presence can be a bit daunting. First of all, it puts a lot of responsibility on them. They feel like they have to perform and, and serve the role of um, the voice of all sensing types all over the world that are not necessarily represented in that meeting. Um, that can be... A, a, a real turnoff when they just wanted to come and learn and sit or observe or whatever, especially when they're new to a chapter. Um, so our, our enthusiasm in having them present can often be 
a, a turnoff. Um, and so fi finding ways to welcome them without um, oh, being really overwhelming, I think, is an important activity for chapters to talk about and discuss. You know, how are we going to welcome people that we want to keep um, without scaring them away? Uh, another complaint I have heard over the years is that there's real inherent bias um, towards intuitives at many of our meetings, our events. Um, not only just about the discussion or if you know it goes off on a tangent of a discussion but also the topics and the resources that are used our tools many of our tools are not intriguing to sensing types and there's bias in and how we talk about sensing types and it's pervasive in our organization and because very often it's uh, we them kind of situation very much like this conversation today it's what can we do to get them in our meetings and it's it's an, an inherent problem within the organization that we've never really found a good way to discuss and be open about and even though we want that input the very way we go about getting that input is often has embedded bias in it so I think paying attention to materials and even to the ways um, meetings are announced and promoted can make a big difference in, in making it feel welcoming to all types. Um, and I'm not sure that we've done a good job of that over the years. I think having some good central resources for ways to do that would be a great idea. Um, they also have a problem in terms of being misunderstood and experiencing negative stereotypes and bias in chapter meetings. Um, I have seen it in chapters where it can become a place where intuit intuitives come together to feel at home and get connected with other intuitives and it can almost become a place that is not safe or comfortable for sensing types because the intuitives might get into some, some bashing of sensing types because of experience, experiences that they're having in their daily life or their work life. Um, their frustrations come out and it cannot, and maybe it wasn't intentional, but the message can be it's those sensing types that create the problems. And I think getting caught up in conversations like that and being a minority representative, res, representative of the type that is being, um, that's getting the, the scapegoating is not a comfortable situation. So I think that can be a big turnoff. Um, I think in general, one of the problems APT has had in the past, I know it's starting to make some shift to some younger generation, but certainly there's a, a stigma that it's an old people's organization and it's a bunch of talking and not doing. And that can be a turnoff, particularly for artisans. Um, and just having too few members like them, um, I think is a problem. They feel like they're, they are a minority and they feel it. And if they aren't comfortable feeling a minority in an organization, it's going to be hard for them to come back to meeting after meeting. Um, in particular for guardians, uh, I think one big problem we have <laughs> is that we are so thrilled to see a guardian walk through the door because we think, oh, officer material. We need their gifts. We need a treasurer. We need a secretary. We need a president. We need someone to lead. We need someone to take care of this organization. And Chances are, particularly if they're new to type or new to the organization, the last thing they want to do is take on an, a, a leadership role. But because they have a natural gifts in that area and their sense of duty, and um, they're often taken in because they think that will be a good way to get to know people and know the organization. But we have to be very careful as 
an organization predominantly of intuitives not to exploit and take advantage of those very gifts that we want so much, but, but mostly tone it down when we see them walk in the door. Um, if you immediately approach, oh, will you be our, our tr new treasurer, um, that can be a bit overwhelming. But I have actually seen that happen, and not in just one chapter, but in two or three different chapters across the country. So um, it's a very real issue, and I've been guilty of it myself, And uh, but it's taken time to realize you just have to really be careful of that because it can be a huge turnoff for guardians. Um, and and the big thing, I think, for guardians is it's just not the wisest use of my time and money. And, you know, that's the one I remember doing a survey, and that was the one that came up more and more and more often than not, was it's not a good use of my time and money. And so finding programming that makes it a good use is is a prerogative. I, it just has to be if you really want to get bring guardians in. Um, the turnoffs in specific for artisans, um, they just can't sit through one more meeting, no matter how interesting the topic. Um, my husband is an ESTP and he would absolutely love to come to meetings. He is a type user. He likes the people when we put him on stage. Um, you know, he's had opportunities to meet the people in the chapter, but on a meeting-to-meeting -meeting basis, he just can't imagine going and sitting in another meeting. Um, so I have to tell him about what we discussed <laughs> when I come home. Um, but that notion of bec being involved in any kind of membership organization is a very difficult hurdle for artisans in general. It's just not the way they want to spend their time. Doesn't mean they're not interested in the material, but a meeting to go and listen and participate by sitting down is generally not a turn on, it's a turn off. Um, and mostly they just want something to be done with it. If they are excited enough to participate in APT, they are excited about type, but they want to be doing something with type. You know, if, if they came, then they want to do. And very often our meetings are not about doing. They're about discussing what we could do or what someone else did. They want to know what they can do. And they want the group to be charged to do something. And um, I th think that one's probably the biggest challenge in getting the artisans in. Um, they also have the very frank, and they're happy to tell you that it's just not the way they want to spend their time and money either, mostly time. Um, so those are kind of a, an overview of, of what the issues are and why it's so difficult for app to really involve guardians and artisans in a meaningful way. Um, the downside to apt not having that involvement is, I think, the biases that are inherent in intuitives um, just run rampant within the community. Um, I remember attending conferences and hearing things come out of speakers' and presenters' mouths that made me want to cringe, um, not because they really didn't like sensing types, but because it was comfortable to be in the presence of predominantly intuitives where they could say what they want and express feelings of frustration that they had experienced in other um, areas of their life. But I think the more we are, are without sense, sensing types in our midst, the more we promote those kind of negative biases and the stereotypes and we aren't rounding ourselves out the way we profess to do if we're believing in the valuing difference. And um, so I think that's the biggest downside to not having participation by sensing types. Um, I think another problem is 
the type community has a lot of ideas and passion, but we're a little short on the people who are actually giving full attention to how do we communicate this wonderful information to the world. Um, we need the dominant extroverted in, uh, sensing and dominant introverted sensing. We need them to operationalize, to embed type and temperament into the social fabric of all communication and interaction. We need their skills to be able to promote it. When you think of all of the communication tools that are out there now, you know, whether it be internet or any other method that people are using to communicate, we have done a very small job in comparison to some of these other avenues in getting the message across about communicating by valuing differences of type. Um, why in the past 20 years has this not become more commonplace? Why is it met with so much resistance when other forms of communication just seem to spread and spread and spread? I think it's because we have lots of passion and ideas, but we don't have implementers um, within our organization, within our groups that are expanding in those ways. And that's the downside to missing half of the types um, that we need to fully um, reach the potential of type and of our organization. Um, I can't tell you how many artisans and guardians I've heard who have come to meetings who have said, you guys are kind of wacky. And by that I mean it just seems off kilter or out of balance. And it is out of balance because not all types are represented. But there is, it seems extreme when they, when sensing types come in from the outside, we just seem very lofty um, and disorganized. Um, part of our problem is we burn out the ends, the intuitive organizers that run the meetings, that run chapters, that have been on the boards forever and continue to do it because they believe so much in type. But at the same time, it's, they, it, it, it becomes a point of burnout and a point of they just can't maintain the level of organization and the level of logistics that's required year after year to maintain a strong chapter. And it exploits what few sensing members we do have. They are often on the board, on the chapter boards, running things, doing those detail-oriented specifics of logistics. And we can't afford to burn out the few that we have. We need more to help organize and run our organization. Um, I want to finish up with some things that I think we can do to attract um, more sensing types into our chapters. Um, one of the, I think one falsehood that's been out there is you need to keep it really professional um, for the sensing types to find the use and value out of it um, so that it has um, relevance for their professional life. But what I have heard over the years for those artisans and guardians who are participating in chapters is that while they come in requesting professional topics, Often, in retrospect, they, they find that the ones that the meetings that were most useful and valuable were the ones that were about personal topics. And so it's a bit counterintuitive. I think we have tried for a long time to make it very geared to professional life um, just because we hear that's what they want. But experience has shown that very often it's exactly the opposite that they find most valuable. Um, having um, sensing types present, I think, is one of the most valuable ways to get them engaged in the chapters. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be professional. 
I have found that very often they're reluctant to share their professional realm because maybe they think it's inappropriate. But if there's some other part of the, their world that they're um, comfortable in and using type, um, like Little League, okay, they're coaching a Little League team. How are they using type with the team? That can be an extremely valuable topic for a presentation um, in terms of a real day-to-day -day life situation, but it's team building. Team building can be applied all the way across any activity. And so you get them, if you offer them the opportunity to present, but have it out of the box a bit, it might get them more engaged in, in a broader spectrum of ways that type and temperament can be used. Um, field trips is a great idea, movie night, type watching, um, they, anything that has a, a I can see it, I can do it kind of activity along with it. Um, case studies, analyzing case studies, um, a laboratory, um, being able to have someone just present what it's like to be their type and have question and answer around that. So it's a real life laboratory of, you know, what, it, what makes an INTP tick or what makes a particular type do this or that. Um, I think it's important for chapters to be really honest about the lack of sensing representation. Um, it's, and also that it's not the intention to keep sensing types out, it's, but at the same time we can it coincidentally kind of myopically becomes habit to have our programs more oriented toward intuitive um, programming. Um, and so their suggestions need to be included, but it's, it's about how you approach them into the chapter. And if they're new to type, um, be conscious and supportive of the fact that they're likely to have experienced a major personal or professional shift in their life. And so they might not really be ready to reveal that at the time but just a consciousness of the fact that very often it takes a major shift for them to have it rise up on the list of their priorities and make it worthwhile for them to become part of a membership organization about type. There's something that got them there, and it can be a personal um, shift. Um, I, I like to use the metaphor of physical exercise about exercising your type skills in an environment of tools and experience and knowledge and it keeps your type skills honed for use in the real world where you might be isolated in your knowledge. That's what a chapter meeting really gives you is the opportunity to be with other people who know type are working with type on a day-to-day -day basis. It's a place to hone those skills and exercise it because you might not have that environment. And so I think that's a way to really encourage sensing types to participate. It makes sense to them that they need to keep those skills um, upgraded. Um, uh, I think I'd like to open it up for questions. I do have some special notes on handouts about artisans. Um, I don't have a need to go over those unless you specifically had any questions about those. So if we can open up the uh, mic. Uh, Stephanie, that gives us a great start. Uh, this is Adam again. Uh, I would like to ask um, if people um, on the call today have uh, sensation preferences either as dominant or auxiliary. If you do, uh, really talk about uh, your experience, perhaps you could um, say that in the chat window. Um, I'm an introverted sensation type, ISF, and I, I will say I've had some of the kinds of experiences uh, that Stephanie described. Um, I was recruited to be treasurer pretty quick after joining the chapter. Um, I think it's important to, you know, remember that Jung said that uh, the sensation function is the, you know, is the reality function, the reality testing function. And so the sensation types are not just needed to 
you know, um, carry the heavy boxes and to do the bookkeeping, but really to do reality testing, to verify that what we think is, is true, you know, is true, to check the data and to be present in the moment, you know, uh, for immediate problem solving in that way that extroverted uh, sensation can do so well. Um, Charles uh, has something to say. Let's, uh, let's um, unmute Charles and, and hear from him. Uh, just a second. Charles, you can speak now. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Uh, you know, I thought that, that that particular presentation that you just did was probably the most insightful uh, presentation I've heard in a long time. And I really appreciated the way that you apologized before you talked. I thought that was phenomenal. You know, that's something that I think that, you know, we really do need to all take into account of not realizing how we might be offending folks. And so when our type comes out uh, and the people who we are, I thought that approach is really good. And I'm going to I've learned a lot just from that particular perspective. So for that, I really appreciate. Thank you. Um, Thank you. The, the, the key thing that I've found over the years, in my 61 years, is that there are three things that people want more than anything. They want to be cared for, they want to be heard, and they want to be nurtured. You know, from my perspective of what I see being married to an intuitive feeler for years and being a sensing thinker, I've found that although my per the perception of me may be aggressive, pushy, those types of things, it's just the way that we show we care. And so I think that, you know, from the board perspective and from an APTI perspective, we really need to have some exposure to acceptance of mindsets from the perspective of understanding people as human beings. And your point of us and them is so well put. It is exactly the way that it seems to be in some particular cases. So. If we can, if we can approach every situation with a mindset of we're coming into this situation to be cared for, we're coming into this situation to care for others, we're coming into this situation to nurture and we expect to be nurtured, and that we come into this being able to be heard and we're willing to hear other people, I think with that perspective, if we start that as a mantra, it will help us tremendously in being able to break down the biases that we bring to the table. That's my thought. I agree, Charles. And I think it's really about walking our talk. If we're if we're about promoting and valuing difference, then being aware of that from the get go and saying, what does everyone need? Um, it, it's going to be a really good foundation for whatever programming is offered. If you start there, you're going to have something for everyone. Um, I'm wanting to ask um, if there are uh, chapters represented that feel that they don't have um, a great shortage of sensation types, maybe there are some chapters where the balance is different. And if, if that's the case, please say so uh, in the uh, chat window. So I see that Charles has said he's the uh, only SJ in his chapter, and he has been asked to lead. Hmm. I also wonder if uh, oh, Mary Charles has a story. Let's let's uh, let me let me unmute Mary Charles. Go ahead, Mary Charles. In two thousand, uh, the reach the uh, Research Triangle Park chapter here in North Carolina, had the regional conference for the Southeast. And what we did was that after we thought about possible topics and things, we sent them out to everybody um, 
asking the sensors to give us feedback on what worked and what didn't work in terms of topics and theme for the conference. And we incorporated that into the uh, planning. And we also got a number of sensors to be on the planning committee. And um, Otto Krager was our keynote speaker. And we had 20% sensors at that conference. It was our biggest and best. Thanks, Mary Charles. Um, we have a comment from uh, Kathleen Murphy that she was the treasurer of the New York chapter. She's an ESFJ. And she says she thinks just recognizing the contributions of, uh, of S uh, is important. And she says that um, in the New York meetings, they had a lot of presenters who directed their presentations towards a business sense. Um, okay. Um, Stephanie, I wonder if you have more um, specific examples of things that have that have worked or that seem promising. Um, it, uh, one thing that occurred to me that I have seen in in several different chapters, and I, I mentioned several different chapters because I've been involved in four different chapters in the past 20 years, and I've also presented at many chapters. So I've had a lot of experience in, in different groups, but I'm always amazed at um, the notion of self-actualization and many times um, sensing types arrive at the chapter because they are on some particular path of self-actualization rather than simply a work path and um, those individuals are absolutely golden. Um, I, I know in our local chapter right now, Ann Loomis, some of you may know her, um, the, the learning and experiences that we receive from her as she is individuating before our eyes is just absolutely amazing um, and so beneficial, I think, for the intuitives to have the experience of her sharing that, um, I th and I have seen, she's not the only one I've seen, I've seen others, both guardians and artisans, who show up on that path, and they're in a different place, and it's, and it's so enriching to a chapter, so I think being, being open to all the, all the possibilities as sensing types do walk through the door is is important and, and invaluable to chapters um, and I think having that um, quality to a chapter is very engaging to all types um, is so it it and it has longevity to it it isn't just, well, this is a relevant organization while I am in this position in my job. It becomes a relevant organization for life because it it is a life-embracing theory behind it. So that's one thing that I've seen and has been really effective for keeping um, sensing types in when they when it has when it passes beyond just what their per current profession is but into a lifelong pursuit um, other things I think the most valuable way to get them involved is to have them present um, and and uh, on any topic but getting them involved that way I I have seen them it it'll it provides the opportunity for them to see how they can connect to the organization and the feedback that they receive is 
is usually very positive um, in terms of I needed to hear that and and I think that kind of response that um, their contribution is so valued is really helpful. Stephanie, I just want to say that as as a program claim um, person on the chapter development committee, um, you know, we do have access to a list of the people who have presented at all the different chapters in recent years. And mostly, I think I have. So if there's any chapter that is having trouble finding um, presenters from different types, uh, don't hesitate to ask. I'll be glad to, you know, dig up what I can find about presenters that have gone to other chapters from particular uh, representing particular types and who have been, you know, uh, well received presenters. Great. You know, I think that the the um, uh, the issue that you raised about um, bias or stereotypes about uh, sensation really goes back to the earliest um, time before um, even before uh, Isabel Myers back to Jung. Um, not that I think that Jung himself was particularly guilty of it, but I think that in the world of uh, Jungian analysts and in Jungian communities, um, there is a certain bias against sensation, particularly extroverted sensation. And um, it, there is kind of a, a failure understanding of its value, I think. And so I, I think this really, this problem goes back um, almost all the way to the beginning of uh, um, the beginning of the type movement in 19, if we start with 1920s location. Yeah, absolutely. And, and particularly I think in the case of the artisans, because there is this pervasive notion that they are not reflective that they are so live in the now that they don't they don't reflect upon themselves or their own behaviors or what they've done or where they've come from which is absolutely not true they may not in exactly the way the other 12 types do but they absolutely are reflective um, but i think that's part of the part of the bias that has continued in in the analytic realm um, that has contributed um, right all the way through in the development of type and temperament. So um, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think it has been there. And I mean, for anybody who reads Jung, it, it's, it's very heady and idea oriented and often the conclusions are not final. It's open-ended and and cycles around again with a new interpretation or a, or a contradiction, and those kinds of things. If you're looking for answers, are are contradictory to that end, and so again, it has to do with the agenda. If someone is looking for, if the agenda is, I want an answer to this, or I want a quick tool for this, that's not going to be the place they're going to find it. I think it's going to be a, a pressing issue. Um, the stereotypes about um, particularly artisan um, temperament is going to be a pressing issue for the type movement because there's more and more stuff written in the literature, not quite in the type movement, but a little outside it, that is leaning towards suggesting that the SP um, um, combination is is uh, tied to criminality, you know, or to uh, seeking, um, not um, not um, thinking first, but acting first. And uh, there's a book, for example, by a guy named Adrian Rain called Anatomy of Violence that that talks about um, um, people who require more sensory stimulation in order to to uh, be satisfied and, and that those people are more likely to be, um, to do criminal violent acts. Susan Cain's book, Quiet, is kind of a bashing of the extroverted sensation function, although she doesn't get into, she doesn't seem to know about the four functions, um, but 
Um, I think that the type movement is going to be actually required to um, defend the artist and temperament against um, being characterized uh, as criminal. Uh, yes, I, I agree, Adam. I, I mean, I don't think this is new. I think this has been brewing for years and years and years. Um, it's um, it, interestingly related to, to, you know, our chapter experience. Um, under my special notes in the handout, um, the very first thing I listed was pushback. Artisans cannot fully engage unless there is an opportunity and social acceptance of pushback. They must be able to counter a point of view, play devil's advocate, offer a personal experience as an example, or try something out in order to fully absorb whatever the content is in a meaningful way. Um, presentation without pushback is simply frustrating to artisans. So I, I, on a very small scale, what you're talking about is the freedom to act on in, impulses, which is the core psychic need of the artisan. They must act. They can't hold off. They can't hold back. They can't wait. In order to understand, they must engage. And when they are not allowed to engage, it is a dampening or a thwarting of that most core psychic need. And if you take that away, not just once, but cumulatively, over and over and over and over again, what it's going to turn into is a retaliation of some kind, either outward or inwardly toward themselves. And this is the basic concept of, of Kiersey's temperament theory. The whole piece of it was to understand that if the core psychic needs are not met, there is a very predictable pattern of how things are going to go bad in, in terms of that person surviving that experience of not having their core psychic needs met. And so for, for an artisan who needs to act on the impulses to engage in the outer world, if they're denied that opportunity, there's going to be frustration. Now at a chapter level, you're probably not going to get somebody who's going to come in and, and um, be so angry at the chapter if they don't get to push back in a meeting that they're going to do something drastic. They're just going to leave instead. But on a societal level, when you're talking about someone who has been repressed over and over and over again in the way in which they experience the world, they are going to have violent responses. We can expect that. And to me, it's as a sociologist, it's not about, yes, they have a proclivity towards violence. It's about what are we doing as a society that's getting them so frustrated that they have now resorted to violence. And in our social institutions in America, we're doing a whole lot to, to repress and to not give opportunity for their core psychic need of freedom to act on impulses to, to occur naturally. You know, we are asking them at five and six years old in school to sit and be quiet. That's an impossibility. So, I mean, all, all of our social institutions work against that need. And so you're right. This is, this is a major. It's not going to become a major problem. It has been a major problem. Um, and a, and a major concern that I think the type community has neglected. And, and, and I think the types of books that you're talking about are going to force us to be a little more um, open about what the needs are. So you got my soapbox. <laughs> there it is. 
Well, I think between the two of us, we've treated the uh, chapter leader a bunch of extroverted feeling concern about these texts. Um, I want to, before our time is almost up, and I do want to talk about next month. Um, but first, I want to really thank um, Stephanie um, for a great presentation. I think you've given us all a lot to think about. And I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, uh, Charles asked how we can um, contact you. Um, can you say that, Stephanie? Yes, I can. Um, actually, on the bottom of the handout, if you get that, um, my email and my phone number, but I'll repeat them now. It's uh, Stephanie at Purpose Points, P U R P O S E P O I N T S dot com. And my phone number is 919 923 3092. Oh, I see it's missed. The, one of the nines is missing the handout. So say it again. Oh, I'm sorry. It's 923. 923-3092. Yes. All right. And Tony, can you give us the uh, third page of the uh, PowerPoint? That's right. So um, our next call is um, December 12, uh, and it'll be led by uh, Jane. Uh, we'll be talking about the process of renewing uh, the chapter's uh, APTI membership and um, uh, how, to do, how to do that, uh, because that's the work of January. And I also want to invite um, all of you to um, give us uh, your suggestions uh, uh, of future uh, topics that you would like us to cover. Uh, we're capable of coming up with topics on our own without input, but we would we really welcome uh, your ideas about what you'd like to hear from hear about in these calls. Uh, and that could be either the SNAP or it could be more about the process of the calls themselves, how they're organized. So please, uh, please feel free to make suggestions about that. We maybe have some time in December to take take your suggestions in the call. Uh, so, and if anybody has any last questions, uh, otherwise, um, I think we'll uh, thank Stephanie and thank you all and look forward to meeting again next month. Great. Thank you.